Hi everyone, welcome to this Make a Medic tutorial. Today's topic is hypokalemia and hyperkalemia. So to understand these irregularities, it's worth thinking about normal potassium homeostasis within the body. So we get a supply of potassium from the diet, so that's mainly from various fruits and vegetables. And the level of potassium is mediated by how much is absorbed in the GI tract and how much is excreted in the kidneys. And the adrenal glands are very important in producing various hormones that can affect potassium levels. So first of all, let's talk about hypokalemia. So things that cause hypokalemia can first of all be due to reduced dietary intake. It can also be due to the loss of various fluids from the body, so for example vomiting or diarrhea. It can be due to issues with the excretion of potassium, so the use of diuretics, in particular loop and thiazide diuretics, can facilitate the excretion of potassium in the urine. And finally, the adrenal glands, as I mentioned, are very important. So the adrenals produce aldosterone, and aldosterone is a very important hormone in maintaining our blood pressure and our salt concentrations. So the normal action of aldosterone is to promote sodium retention and potassium excretion in the kidneys by acting on mineralocorticoid receptors. So on that basis, hyperadrenalism, which is when you get excess production of hormones from the adrenal gland, can result in hyperkalemia by increasing the excretion of potassium in the kidneys. So Kohn syndrome is a condition in which uh, an adrenal adenoma produces excess amounts of aldosterone. And Cushing's is a state in which you have high levels of cortisol. And cortisol, though it is a glucocorticoid, can, when in high concentrations, also act upon mineralocorticoid receptors and produce effects very similar to high levels of aldosterone. So both of these conditions can result in hypokalemia. On the other hand, with hyperkalemia, kidney failure is a very important cause because the kidneys are important in removing potassium from the blood. Other types of diuretics, so namely ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, which interrupt the aldosterone pathway, and also potassium sparing diuretics such as spironolactone and amiloride can promote potassium retention. So the opposite of Cushing's and Kohn's would be Addison's disease, in which you get primary adrenal cortical failure and an inability of the adrenal cortex to produce aldosterone and cortisol. So this would result in potassium retention. An important thing to bear in mind is that a hemolyzed blood sample can cause a high potassium result. This is because potassium is mainly an intracellular ion, so the bursting of red blood cells can release high concentrations of potassium into the sample and hence give you an erroneous result. So that's why it's important to correlate the potassium level with ECG findings and also the clinical state of the patient. If you think the sample may have hemolyzed, you should repeat that sample. So ECGs are very important because the main complication of hyperkalemia and hypokalemia is that it can affect the electrical conduction within the heart and give rise to uh, ventricular arrhythmias. So typical findings that you see in hyperkalemia is a prolonged PR interval, tented T waves, and also broad QRS complexes. As I mentioned earlier, the main concern with hyperkalemia is that it can lead to ventricular arrhythmias that can be fatal. So it's important to manage it promptly. So first and foremost, before we actually deal with the serum potassium concentration, we need to protect the heart and prevent it from slipping into some sort of arrhythmia. So this is done by giving IV calcium gluconate. So, so the amount given can range from 10 to 30 mils of 10% calcium gluconate. So that's the first step in the management. This can be repeated every 15 minutes or so up to five doses whilst you wait for that potassium to come down. In terms of actually reducing the potassium level, the mainstay of treatment is using insulin, so 10 units of Actrapid, and giving some glucose along the side as well because the use of insulin in this case is to drive the potassium into the cells and not really to mess with anything to do with glucose. So to prevent hypoglycemia, 100 mils or 20% glucose should be given with the act rapid. A second line management option is a salbutamol nebulizer because salbutamol can also help drive potassium into the cells. It's also important to investigate for a cause of hyperkalemia. So the drug chart is a very important thing to check because various medications can have a profound impact on serum potassium concentrations. 
User needs are also important to check renal function, and for adrenal insufficiency, a short tenactin test would also be useful, as it would test the ability of your adrenals to respond to stimulation. Thank you.